Okay, we are going to move on to uh, our, uh, our fourth panel. And uh, our fourth panel is uh, being chaired by Jennifer McKim. Um, uh, Jennifer is a senior investigative reporter and a senior trainer at the New England Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, her work has always focused on social issues. Uh, she has worked socially for a long time, including before this at the Boston Globe, where she was there in, in 2008. She received the 2011 Casey Medal for Meritorious Journalism for a story in domestic sex trafficking of minors, and second place 2013 Casey Medal nod for investigation in global child pornography. Um, before that, she was a staff writer at the, at the Orange County Register in California for 10 years. She led a group of reporters to write about lead-tainted imported Mexican candies, which was uh, um, uh, nominated for the 2005 Pulitzer Prize in Public Service. She graduated from uh, Wesleyan, Connecticut, but started her career in uh, San Juan, um, uh, Puerto Rico. Jennifer. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here um, and listening to all of you folks with these really important findings. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this panel because, um, as you just heard, I spent six years in Puerto Rico, so I'm excited to hear about that. All of these things are a big passion. Um, the elderly and criminal justice is a project we at the New England Center for Investigative Reporting have focused a lot on over the last couple of years. Um, so I love this idea. We, as investigative journalists, like to focus on data, data and documents to tell true stories using real people and to be here sort of this fusion of um, academics um, and researchers as a, with a connection to journalists is really exciting. So I want to start with Michael Bird, who will be our first speaker. He is a Santo Domingo Kiwa Pueblo Indian from New Mexico with more than 30 years of public health experience with Native American populations in areas including substance abuse prevention, health promotion, and disease prevention. He's currently a national consultant to AARP on Native American Alaska Native communities, and the rest I'll hand over to you. Okay. They said there's a clock here. Oh, okay, good. And uh, this is the, all righty. All right, well, um, good afternoon and um, greetings from the high desert of New Mexico. I am from, as was mentioned, from Santa Domingo and uh, Santa, San Juan Pueblo in New Mexico, Kiwa Pueblo. And uh, we have been living in the high desert of New Mexico from anywhere from uh, 10 to 20,000 years. Uh, so I also consider myself an indigenous immigration expert. Um, so wel welcome to our country. Uh, <laughs> and um, and uh, if anybody would like to have a discussion about immigration policy, I'm, I'm making myself available. Interestingly enough, uh, no one has bothered to ask Indians what they think about immigration policy and who should be here and who should not. Uh, maybe we should have built a wall a long time ago. Uh, I wanted to just also just give a shout out to APHA and the American Journal of Public Health. Uh, their May issue of 2017, they featured a picture uh, that was taken at, at uh, at Standing Rock in, in, in North Dakota, uh, and they chronicled uh, the, the story of what, what happened in, in, uh, at Standing Rock, and I will be making reference to that um, a bit. 15 minutes is not a whole lot of time, but let's see what we can do. And what, I'm, what I'm sharing with you now is a, is a quote uh, that you can read by Felix Cohn who was um, the, uh, an attorney and, and jurist and the editor on the American Indian Handbook uh, of Indian Law. And a quote by James Baldwin. Now, why, why is it important to understand and have some knowledge of American Indians, besides the fact that I think it's the best thing in the world? Um, 
Well, I think it's, it's significant and important because it really, um, the, the foundation of this nation and the prototype and the, the infrastructure and the way that, that this nation evolved first and foremost came out with it because of the interaction with native communities and native populations. And uh, if you have any questions about that, I'd suggest um, a, a, a wonderful book that describes, um, uh, it's by Richard Drennan, Facing West, The Metaphysics of Indian Hating and Empire Building. And, and he describes how this relationship evolved in terms of Europeans and Indians and Indian people being defined by European people, the first colonists here, as the other. And that has, that has been the basis for uh, a po our domestic policy as we dealt with native communities uh, and also the basis for our foreign policy. So I think there's a lot to be learned from that. And I guess the other part of this is that there has been no community who, whose lives have been more molded, grounded, uh, both for bad and for good and for ill than American Indian tribes and American Indian communities. It appears to me, in my opinion, that what really is important, context is really critical to any kind of analysis. And when you're talking about native populations in terms of the history of removal and, and, and genocide, and you're also talking about the history of African Americans in slavery, you have to take all of those into consideration in terms of any sort of analysis and any, if, you hope, if you really hope to have any kind of understanding of what really happened in this nation and that continues to play out to this day. I'm now gonna just go over very briefly um, some policy periods that, that, that had, have had profound implications in terms of native policy. Uh, 1492 to 1928, of course, is the colonial period. Uh, this was a period of time where Europeans uh, continued to make their dominance known. Um, and the US and tribal nations established early on a government to government relationship in which they, the colonial powers had to recognize and deal with tribes as in a government to government which evolved into treaty making because the, the tribal nations were at that point uh, provided a balance of power. The U.S. Constitution includes Indian provisions, so there's language in the Constitution that references Indian, Indian communities, Indian tribes, and Indian people. And out of that, the Supreme Court came up with the concept of a trust relationship, which is critical in terms of the law and legal policy that, that impacts native communities. The reservation, the removal and reservation period uh, was at a point in which it was, the efforts were made to move, as we moved on, to move Indian tribes from within states and, and to encourage them to move, quote unquote, voluntarily uh, to, to the West. Out of this came what was described, and Andrew Jackson was responsible for this, the Trail of Tears, in which the five civilized, so-called civilized tribes in, 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 in the Southeast were forcibly removed in the middle of winter. And this was not, they did not have an option, this was voluntary, they were forced to, to move West to Oklahoma. Um, we'll move on to also the Snyder Act of 1921 enacted and authorized federal and health services to tribes. So there was, a, there was this developing ongoing relationship that the federal government assumed responsibility for. And, um, and we had then the Indian reorganization period. Oh, let me back up real quick. At one point in time, there was a U.S. general that declared that the only good Indian was a dead Indian. Sorry, I'm still here. Sorry, we're still here. Uh, then there was the re Indian reorganization period and the act, in an act in 1934 
that ended the allotment sort of approach to dealing with native populations. There also has been, there was an effort to invest and develop economic, an economic base for tribes, so there was ongoing uh, investment and support for tribes. Then we see, we see a movement in the other direction in a period that was called the termination period, which in fact, the Congress, the U.S. Congress, uh, in, terminated 100 tribes' rights and declared them not to be tribes any longer, which posed a real threat to all tribes, but critically impacted those tribes that were defined as, as having been terminated. The, at this period in time, they also, the Congress passed laws that usurp the right of tribal sovereignty and tribal self-governance. And uh, it, it was in 1955 that the Indian Health Service was established as an agency to provide health care to native communities, populations. Uh, as we can see moving on, 1968, with this is self-determination period. This, this again was a swing back to the more progressive side and and um, this came about during Richard Nixon's term, and, um, and actually there was a move to increase, recognize the tribe's right to self-governance. Um, in, they increased support and encouraged the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Indian Health Service to work, work with tribes, and, um, and to, um, th there was a public law 93-638, Indian self-determination, <coughs> which allowed tribes to take over and contract or compact for their own programs, allowing them and recognizing their right to govern their own people and to provide services utilizing the resources that previously had gone to, to federal agencies. Uh, what we now um, are looking at today is, is um, and has been a nation-to-nation um, approach to governance in more recent years, and um, and and this was legitimized and promoted by uh, President Clinton in Executive Order 13175, which called for tribal consultation with tribes. Now, and and was reaffirmed by President Obama. This basically required all federal agencies to work hand in glove, hand in hand. With, tribe, with tribes, and this was, I think, one of the lead agencies was um, um, EPA early on, and they had one of the most successful programs um, in terms of coming to recognize that in order to be successful and, and deal with tribes in a respectful way, you first had to acknowledge the fact that, that they were that, we, that there was a government-to-government -government relationship established with them. Uh, I think that what I would also say to you is that um, there, there are two, two points I want to make at this point. This just, I mean, you know, it's 500 years of history in 15 minutes, so hey. Um, but there are two other things I want to just reference, and one is right now, um, as of last week, there was, there's, a, there's a major a major issue that's 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 on the that's on the on the front burner in terms of tribal status um, the tribal status of uh, is being questioned and CMS is now attempting to dictate to tribes how they can run how they can direct their programs how they can run their own programs and basically is failing to recognize 250 years of of treaties of, of federal law and of, and of executive orders, and now wanting to say that um, Indian people who have a government-to-government -government relationship, who are treated in a very exclusive sort of way because of the history of this nation, now will just be treated like everyone else in terms of, take, in a way, undermining tribal sovereignty and, in a, in a very real sense, moving tribal populations to, into, the, into the melting pot and, of course, Many of us already know what happens in the melting pot. Uh, so that is a major and significant issue. I think the other thing I wanted to just really reference right now is, is the fact that there was a Standing Rock, which happened uh, a little over a year ago, 
year and a half ago was was a was a extremely unique and special event. It was extremely unique because tribes were standing up for tribal sovereignty, they were protecting sacred sites, and they were taking to issue both the federal and state government for failing to consult with them on a project that had that could have potential negative adverse effects on their water and their land. Uh, this was in North Dakota. The, the original pipeline was supposed to go by Bismarck, which is the state capital. Uh, the people in Bismarck, needless to say, pri primarily a non-native community, did not want the pipeline in their backyard, but it was fine if the pipeline went into and, and, uh, uh, and had potential impact on the Standing Rock Reservation. Not only the Standing Rock Reservation, but a number of states downstream and a number of communities with the potential to, to, uh, to impact in, a, in, a, in an environmental, potential environmental disaster for that community, everyone downstream. Uh, as people know, there was a major, more Indians came together since the, since the, the, the Battle of the Little Bighorn and, uh, and many non-Indian people rose to their defense and came and supported them. I think the number they said at one point was 10,000, uh, 10,000 not protesters, but water protectors came together. A number of veteran groups came and probably were responsible for the, the fact that, that, that uh, there was not more violence on the side of, of the, the state and, and um, because there, there was a militarized response unlike we've seen in any other situation or circumstance in a number of years. So I think what I would say to you right now is that the environmental perspective that Native people have had in the Americas, not just in North America, but the Americas and globally, is one of defending our land, defending our water, defending our resources, and defending our people. And we continue in that, in that vein. And we, if you have not read Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Sixth Extinction, it, it is a reminder that our mother, our mother is the earth, our mother gives us life and sustenance, and without her, we cannot live. Now, people want to go to Mars, we may not have to buy the ticket, we may be creating that reality right here, right now. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So um, our second speaker is Alvin Carrasquillo. He is a professor of medicine and public health sciences at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. He's a Puerto Rican born physician who was raised in the Bronx. Prior to working in Miami, Carrasquillo was director of the Center for Excellence in Health Disparities Research at Columbia University. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and again, thank you very much. Uh, my only disclosures are, I'm um, sorry, and if anyone could give me a better title uh, to the talk, it would be much appreciated. Um, but anyway, uh, and as soon as I figure out the clicker, there it goes. Uh, these are my disclosures. As you heard, I am Puerto Rican. I have family in Puerto Rico. Um, and when Irma struck Miami, I spent three days without AC or power, most horrible. I literally almost died. And so I cannot believe how people could spend months and months without power or electricity. Um, so I do have to give, hopefully not a 50-minute history talk, but a brief history of Puerto Rico, uh, which is uh, slightly different from the textbooks that the US government wrote on Puerto Rico that you'll read about. But Puerto Rico actually became autonomous in 1897. And they actually voted for their own government and had actually started their own government in Puerto Rico. And about a month later, after they did that, the United States, that had been planning to invade the island, take control of Spain for several years, actually invaded and said, yeah, I know you have your own government, but we actually want to bring you, bring you the blessings of enlightened civilization. <laughs> Soon after that, they devalued the currency by 40%. It was uh, basically a bargain sale, and all the U.S. multinational corporations bought out most of the island, predominantly the, dom the predecessor to the Domino Sugar Factory, and overnight they transformed the agricultural system into almost all based on sugar cane, control the railroads, control the seaports, very much standard oil-like kind of stuff. 
Uh, in 1917, Puerto Ricans were granted citizenship. A month later, tens of thousands were drafted to serve in World, World War I, and they continued to serve disproportionately in the military. Um, 1917, which I'll talk a little, about, a little bit about, was the shipping monopoly. In 1948, when people were very upset and wanted their own independence for a lot of things that were going on, the gag law, which made it a felony to talk about independence, speak against the United States or have a Puerto Rican flag, went into effect. And in 1952, finally, they decided not to give them independence like they had done to a lot of other countries, but they needed it for strategic purposes uh, for the Pan Panama Canal, and they uh, gave it self-governing, which was a joke, as I'll say in a second. Fast forward to 1984, for reasons nobody knows, Puerto Rico, um, the U.S. Congress passed a law that basically did not allow Puerto Rico to declare bankruptcy. Nobody can go back and say this. And then in 1996, Bill Clinton decided to end a lot of the protections that allowed corporations to work in Puerto Rico tax-free, which led to corporate flight from Puerto Rico, 100,000 dollars where 100,000 jobs were lost over the next 10 years. And Clinton said he would address the Puerto Rico issue, which never happened. A bunch of worthless, non-binding plebiscites is all that he did. So that's the history lesson. Um, uh, and then this was the other one. So in 2006, the court again, this is the Obama administration arguing that Puerto Rico was indeed a colony and did not have a right to self-determination or self-governance. And basically, uh, the court solidified that the Puerto Rico, unlike tribal nations, although that may change, do not have any sovereign rule to themselves, and they're pu ruled purely by Congress, and they actually have no say in what happens in their island. So that's the history lesson, and now the economic lesson. So as you heard, once other corporations grew, it started a downward spiral, lots of capital flight out of Puerto Rico, created a tremendous debt problem, almost $80 billion. And this has been a problem that had been created by decades of profiteering, as you could imagine. Um, the Jones Maritime Act, which makes goods in Puerto Rico anywhere from 20 to 40 percent more expensive, as you heard with other neoliberalism, it's about $6 billion a year that the citizens of Puerto Rico transfer to U.S. multinational shipping uh, industries who actually are very well represented in Congress, unlike the people of Puerto Rico. And this goes on and on. Um, and this was basically, it was a fight of Wall Street, the bull and the frog uh, represents Puerto Rico had no chance. But basically, as the debt got up worse and worse, Wall Street kept selling, selling bonds. Uh, making lots of money and repackaging and reselling these bonds and reselling them and reselling them, uh, basically made, made tons of money as the island was further, further um, imposed in debt. One of the most notorious people uh, was actually UBS, personally affected some of my family members with tremendous financial losses. Uh, as they realized these bonds were really hard to defend, they started actually selling them back to the actual people of Puerto Rico. Uh, a tremendous Ponzi scheme, and then they uh, prevented the people in Puerto Rico from selling back these bonds. Um, SEC basically found that they willfully violated a bunch of portions, up a bunch of laws, but it was clear that everyone knew this was going on, everyone looked the other way, and when UBS got caught, uh, they had made billions of dollars off of this. They got a $25 million fine, in effect. So um, kind of created the downward spiral. Uh, but you know, everyone was in on this. This is an institution, I think, across the river from here that also participated in this Ponzi scheme. But everyone really um, made off on this. And NPR has a very nice series talking about the financial conditions that created the debt crisis in Puerto Rico. Um, as far as our healthcare system, the literature calls it Arbola. We knew it as a regional healthcare system, but it was basically a traditional public uh, sector health delivery system that existed before in Puerto Rico. And the care was free. It was free clinics, and you had secondary and then tertiary centers all lined up about this. Major role for training health professionals. And then in 1968, which we'll get to in a second, the Medicaid block grants uh, were enacted, which initially paid 50% of the Medicaid cuts back in 1968. However, uh, the block grant was capped. So this is going back. That amount of money the federal government would kick in kept getting smaller and smaller. Led to government budget cuts and rationing, low salaries. A lot of the doctors that worked in the public sector spent most of the time in their private practices. I think you've heard this from other countries. But the perception that the private services were much better than the public. And so came the solution, which was basically sell all your public health infrastructure. So this is neoliberalism 20 years ago that happened in Puerto Rico. This is an overnight intended experiment where all public funds were now transferred to private care delivery system uh, through for-profit HMOs. Um, and again, increasingly underfunded, access to care poor, uh, long wait, substandard, the same accusations that were leveled against the public sector now were being leveled at this new system, except it was for-profit system, so you couldn't say much about it. And basically, unregulated payments to doctors were very delayed, oftentimes don't happen. Um, 
It was initially supposed to be paid by the Clinton reform of the 1990s, but since that didn't happen, it meant the island had to continue selling more and more bonds, so further worsened um, how much debt. Um, and at current, it's really what I call a publicly financed uh, system. It covers 60% of the population, but 77% of the healthcare financing comes either from the federal or much more from the local government. So it's really, right now, a publicly financing. Um, so the Medicaid, which is called MiSalud, covers most of them either Medicaid or low-income populations and the dual eligible. Again, it's mostly sustained by borrowing. Um, and the government has spent over $20 uh, billion in the last uh, 15 years trying to maintain this thing. They're not allowed to participate in the Medicaid drug rebate program. Uh, only provides limited benefits. They're exempt from all the mandatory Medicaid benefits. And it has the lowest uh, spending in Medicaid um, in the country. It's a regional system. Each for-profit HMO has a particular part of the country where they run a monopoly is basically the way it works. And again, the major problem is that Medicaid is capped. So it's a capped, very low level, which I'll get to in a second, and has the, av uh, the lowest cost by far of any country in terms of premiums. Look at Puerto Rico in the bottom, 165 versus all others. Um, the ACA provided a temporary cash infusion for Puerto Rico uh, um, that was supposed to sunset in 2018, but much, much smaller than what the island actually needs if you use the correct formulas on how Medicaid should be calculated. Um, and as you see that blue bar, that's how much uh, the ACA was supposed to do, but after that, it would revert back to uh, borrowing again and debt, which the island could not do. Medicare, almost all the beneficiaries in Medicare and a managed care plan up in Puerto Rico, but it also has the lowest rates in the United States. So similar to Medicaid, very, very low rates. Medicare challenges, they pay the same taxes, but disproportionate share payments are not calculated the same because Puerto Ricans are not eligible for SSI. Part B is not automatic enrollment like in the United States, and the Medicare formulas used to Medicare pay the Medicare Advantage plans are also incorrect, and so creates tremendous uh, disparities in payment. So basically, uh, this is my friend from the Puerto Rico um, Health Policy Research Institute. He estimates that altogether, it's about uh, $7 billion that Puerto Rico every year is short uh, on money that should come from the federal government to Puerto Rico, does not flow in. Uh, and if you, that's using Mississippi as the example. If you use New York, it'd be a lot more. Surprisingly, when you look at health outcomes, the health of Puerto Ricans is not there, sort of like middle of the bar. If you look at things like mortality rates, uh, despite all these social determinants, they're actually sort of the middle compared to other US states, and certainly much better than all these red states in the southeast. Um, when you rank it by other things, uh, you know, they don't do that bad in cardiovascular mortality. They figure everyone's covered by this misalud, so health insurance is actually not bad. This is before Obamacare. Uh, there are some things, diabetes and hypertension, sedentary activities that are higher, but overall it is not worse. And then obviously the brain drain, which is all the doctors that have been leaving before the hurricane, leaving the island, um, that have gone on. So basically this is what was going on before the hurricane, massive death, uh, massive debt, economy who was contracting, and the island declared bankruptcy. So Obama threw out this uh, lifeline, which is basically um, what we call PROMESA right now to strengthen Puerto Rico. PROMESA was basically, as some have called it, an authoritarian collection agency for hedge funds. It did exempt Puerto Rico from non uh, lawsuits. At the same time, Puerto Rico gave up any, any semblance of sovereignty. You had a, a president-appointed panel making all decisions, controlling all government industries and agencies, including the education system, including Medicaid. Um, and a lot of bad stuff. They immediately installed criminal penalties for any government official that blocks any of their actions and exempted themselves and the United States government from any of their decisions from lawsuits. Then we had this, which actually the first one was this one, which some of you may not know. Remember, this is Irma skirted the islands two weeks before Maria, which my dad described it up. Interestingly, he described Irma compared to Maria as a gentle breeze in his thing. And then this, which he described as Godzilla picking up your house and shaking it for several hours, violently, violently shaking your house. Uh, that basically uh, destroyed the island. And then, of course, relief arrived. Uh, we had this man come out of trope uh, paper towels. Um, and we had this lady telling him, it's not a good story. Lots of bad things are happening um, coming to the island. So basically, the healthcare system was devastated for several months. It took most of the hospitals two to three months to come up to operational capacity. Uh, basically, you had tremendous logistical problems with dialysis, chemotherapy treatments were interrupted for uh, months for certain people. Uh, and we had certain deaths, leptospirosis, which had pretty much disappeared as the spirochete down there uh, came back. 
and obviously the hiding of deaths. Uh, so there was a spike in deaths that everyone knew about. Everyone in the island was fully aware, except for the governor of Puerto Rico, who had to try to pretend this was a good story. Um, it did bring out private relief efforts, the private organizations, tons of volunteerism that came out of a lot of different organizations. We had from uh, University of Miami, Doctoras Boricuas participated, but tons of people, private relief efforts that came out. And basically the strength and resiliency, how each of the communities bonded together to help each other out. But at, and the health clinics played a major role in a lot of this, but they all felt they got no relief from any government entity in doing a lot of these private relief efforts. And then the profiteers obviously kicked in. We heard about Whitefish, but there's a whole bunch of other people that obviously contributed and made a ton of money off the prices, just like all corporations do whenever there's a crisis. And actually, the local profiteering, you know, the people selling gasoline at three times got people really mad, but nobody seemed to really be mad about the major corporations because they're like, that's what they do. Um, and this, the New York Times has a story about the electrical grid I'm sure many of you want to hear about. But the health system, pretty much now it's back to normal. Some of the clinics still don't have power. They're working on generators. One of them has solar energy, but they're back in power. Um, and the big thing now is the mental health challenges that are ongoing. A lot of reports about increased costs of suicide, suicide rates. There has been a small spike in suicides, but anecdotally, it is a major problem the island's facing right now. Then the Balanced Budget Act earlier this year basically brought temporary relief that extended that ACA funding until 2019, but conditions that you have to take appropriate steps, most importantly set up a Medicaid fraud control unit was a big thing that was demanded, even though they have the lowest rate. And then two weeks ago, uh, then the relief agency Promesa released their plan for restructuring the island. For education, a lot of it is about closing schools, uh, cutting $300 million from a severely underfunded educational system, uh, labor reform, basically five-year hiring freeze on any government employees and limiting things like their vacation time. And then there was tax reform, which they went out of the way, even though this was about saving money, we have to cut corporate taxes. These multinationals, they pay too many taxes. We need to make sure the people of Puerto Rico pay more taxes and relieve these multinationals from their tax burden. Um, so really sad stuff. Um, Immediately, they put in stricter verification for, to get government insurance, mandatory uh, generics for all medications, uh, and very, very narrow formularies are some of the immediate things that were implemented. But obviously, a big focus of the recommendations is that they think that 5% of the population is enrolled inappropriately to Medicaid, and that's where it should be. They also want to make sure anyone that leaves the island and moves to the United States is immediately disenrolled from Medicaid and wanting to set up those mechanisms. Um, and telling the managed care organizations that are already notorious they need to be stricter in terms of their limit. Um, Medicaid reform, they also um, want to cap payments to the managed care organizations, benefit redesign, which means cutting benefits, increase ER co-payments, some of the same stuff you heard before. They also are very mad some w government workers get plans that pay up to actually $500 a month in value. They want to cut everyone down to $100 as a maximum uh, government health benefit. And then on the table is cutting other optional benefits like dental, uh, eye care, and physical therapy and some of the other stuff. And then they want to save money. They say, oh, we're going to implement uh, patient-centered medical home. We're going to pay for performance, things that have never been shown to save money in the United States, but in Puerto Rico will dramatically save money. And obviously, it left out the important stuff, the Medicaid fix, the drug discounts, the Medicare fix, the Jonax, reparations for all the evils of Wall Street. So it doesn't address the fundamental problems. The cost savings are pie in the sky. And this is from an article that says, some stakeholders question whether after a major hurricane and having the lowest reimbursement rate, even cutting uh, costs more well, is actually the right solution. And then obviously disaster capitalism is next. Uh, for sale, the public health, uh, the, pub, um, the electric system is obviously being sold off, but education is now, any edu future educational aid is gonna be tied to basically privatizing charter schools and school vouchers, and next, people are afraid is the, pri or the other uh, government sector stuff. So in summary, Puerto Rico is a colony. The debt crisis was caused by external policies, and as usual, the corporate entities have profited very nicely from this disaster, um, and it brings out the same old profiteering, and the reforms are gonna actually make something uh, much worse. And with that, I'll end the talk. Thank you. Wow, that was a lot of information in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, so Lelo Tesema is a general internal medicine physician. 
She is the Director of Population Health for the Los Angeles County Correctional Health Services in the Department of Health Services. There she is. She's an assistant professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of Southern California and a GARE Fellow at the GARE Family Center for Health Systems System Science. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you, Dean Galea and Lindsay Marakwar, for organizing this really tremendous event. I appreciate being here, and I'm very lucky to be um, a member of this distinguished panel. So um, I'm going to start with uh, a local story and try to frame the data and the, uh, the discussion that I'd like to have uh, based on what I see at the LA County Jail. Now the LA County Jail is the largest jail system in the country. Um, at any given day we book about three to 500 people um, and 100,000 people annually. We have a population of, of 20,000 people at any given time, which is twice the size of Rikers Jail, which is the second lar largest jail in the country. Oh, sorry. I apologize. Oh, the green. Sorry about that. Thank you. See, you don't have to be, uh, you can be young and not tech savvy. <laughs> so I'm just dispelling, dispelling the stereotype. Um, so if we, if we look uh, hi historically, um, how do we get to the point where we are booking uh, c close to 100,000 people a year in jail? Well, this is a picture of uh, Angola prison in Angola, Louisiana. I would like to say that this is a dated photograph, but it is not. I was actually in Angola, Louisiana two years ago where I did some work on housing reentry for the justice involved. And if you look at this picture, I think, uh, I, I think it's extremely telling when we think about the historical context of where mass incarceration stems from, which is largely a legacy of slavery and the subsequent commodification of black bodies in the post-Jim Crow era um, or dare I say it, white supremacist principles, if I'm allowed to say that in this room. Um, so that shadow of slavery, that shadow of systemic and structural racism is very much alive uh, in our prisons and jails around the country. Um, but the prison boom and the sort of expansion of the prison population really took off in the late 1980s. As you can see historically, the prison population was pretty much steady until uh, about two decades ago. And there's a, we see a knifing point in the late 1980s and early 90s. How did this happen? Well, policy is everything, right? So, oh, sorry. Um, so in the late 1980s and early 90s, three very important policies were put in place that resulted in the US prison boom. First is the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 and 1988. And secondly, were the, uh, what is now known as the Clinton, Clinton cr Crime Bill of 1994. This led to three consequences. First, um, not, not, there was an increase in the number of people who were incarcerated for drug-related offenses, nonviolent and drug-related offenses. Secondly, they were incarcerated for longer periods of time, so more people were locked up for longer periods of time. And thirdly, discriminatory sentencing policies that uh, assign much harsher sentences to crack cocaine versus cocaine, 100, which is what was known as the 100 to 1 bill, led to a deepening divide of, uh, of you know, whites and blacks represented in the prison population. I see this racial divide every day in the hallways of the building that I work in and the clinic uh, that I see patients in. This is a picture of the clinic that I work in Men's Central Jail in LA County. 80% of my patients are black and brown, um, and, and in spite of changes in drug sentencing laws, this uh, racial uh, divide, if you will, has really been an intractable issue in the criminal justice system. Uh, you know, our jails are not only profoundly racially segregated, but they're also overcrowded. So at LA County Jail, we have about 120 to 200 percent overcapacity in our jails. They were not built to house the number of people uh, that we arrest. This is a picture of our women's jail in Linwood. Um, as you can see, it's an, it's an overcrowded facility. At any given point, it's about 150 to 200 percent and overcapacity. 
women are actually the fastest growing population in corrections. So the number of women in jails has increased 14-fold, 14 14-fold 14 since 1970. Um, and, and in spite of overall decreases in the prison population, less so in the jail population, we see a skyrocketing in, in, of women in our jails. I think women are uniquely vulnerable to both the social and economic as well as the health harms of incarceration, and I think three statistics are worth noting here. First, the vast majority are actually incarcerated for nonviolent drug-related offenses. The vast majority are also mothers. This is data from LA County. 80% are mothers, most are single mothers. Um, and so when you think about this in the context of population health, you can uh, imagine the spillover and collateral consequences that this has on children, on families, and on the communities that they leave behind. Lastly, and I credit the Vera Institute for this really um, thoughtful and rigorous work, 86% um, are thought to have experienced at least one uh, uh, at least one event of sexual violence in their lifetime. So one can, um, one can make the argument that jails are actually the worst place or the most harmful, base, harmful place for somebody with a history of gender-based trauma to be in. I think this is especially salient now with the sort of Me Too movement and the galvanizing around sexual assault in workplaces. Like sexual assault anecdotally, I can say is, is probably more rampant than we give credit for in environments like this where the power differential is so uh, wide between uh, you know, inmates and, 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 um, and, and the deputies or custody. And, and uh, in fact, uh, recently there have been more lawsuits emerging in LA County of deputy-inflicted sexual assault of female inmates in our jails, and it's extremely harrowing um, to see. Um, our, our patients are not only uh, Sorry, I, just, oh, I apologize. <laughs> um, our patients come in in poor health and, and poor access to health care. So over half are uninsured. This is most recent data that we uh, extracted. And actually pre-ACA, this was much worse. It was around 90%. So this is, looks like a bad number, but, the, but it's actually moving in the right direction. And I credit some of the enrollment work that we're doing for that. Of course, we want the number to be much smaller. Uh, virtually everyone who comes in comes in with a chronic, at least one chronic condition with an overrepresentation of course of mental illness and substance use, as well as communicable diseases like HIV and Hep C. In addition to um, the, the sort of health profiles and poor health uh, of this population, uh, many of them s s are, are sort of trapped in poor social determinants of health. So one in three are homeless at LA County Jail. This is probably an underestimate from the data that we got. It's probably close to 50% if you include people who are precariously housed or in, in, in unstable housing situations. Um, this is a picture of Skid Row, uh, which is about a mile and a half from our jail. Uh, LA has one of the largest homeless populations in the country, and it's continuing to rise. Actually, the affordability housing crisis is worse in LA than any other uh, city because of the gap between median home and rent prices and median income. And we see this in our jail based on the sort of intractable cycle between homelessness, poverty, mental illness, and crimes of poverty that land our patients in our jails. And although we're trying to sort of mount efforts to get people housed, specifically people with mental illness, the threats to funding cuts for um, HUD specifically uh, really undermine the work that we're trying to do, specifically in a city where affordable housing is extremely scarce. So as many of you know, um, uh, you know HUD Secretary Ben Carson wants to raise rents, wants to actually triple rents uh, for the poor. Uh, wants to enforce uh, um, work, work for people who are receiving federal subsidies and live in uh, and federal, federally subsidized housing and essentially shrink federal subsidies um, in an already, I think, dire uh, affordable housing crisis. So this is something that we are very deeply worried about just given how tight and, and direct the linkage between homelessness and incarceration is for our population. In addition to threats to housing as a major sort of social program and social safety net, 
Uh, we are particularly uh, concerned and distressed about what Medicaid cuts will, how Medicaid cuts will impact our population. This is a study that looked at insurance gains post ACA for the justice involved. And although they were modest, about 9 to 13% reduction in uninsurance uh, post in, for the ACA post involved, this is larger when we looked at our county data, um, and it was largely driven by dependent coverage and Medicaid expansion. At LA County, uh, about close to 90% are actually Medicaid eligible, which is pretty good. And, uh, and we've, we take this data very seriously, and we've, we've invested resources in making sure that people are enrolled once they leave. Specifically, people with serious mental illness are, uh, we know that Medicaid from preliminary data is more likely to, uh, to has, has some effect on uh, recidivism. Uh, as well as likeliness to access community mental health services once they leave. So cuts to Medicaid, which have been, as, as you know, proposed in the 2019 budget, uh, as well as the reversal of expansion, uh, are, are major direct threats to, to some of the gains that we've seen post-ACA. In addition to attacks on our social safety net, uh, we are deeply concerned about the, the sort of move towards privatization of our prisons, uh, a move that, w that was starting to peel back under the Obama administration. So uh, in the, under the Obama administration, actually, there were guidelines to close all federal private prisons, which aren't a large share of prisons. They're about 5%. Uh, but it was a very important gesture, I think, and an acknowledgement that the privatization of these prisons are not only morally unethical, but also... Um, just indefensible, um, um, morally indefensible. That has been swiftly undone by this administration. The, the, they plan to sort of reinstate private prisons. Um, in fact, these are days after Trump was elected. There was a 100% increase in the stocks of the two major uh, private prison companies, which is CCA, Correct, Corrections Corporation of America, and GEO. So this isn't, you know, this isn't a subtle... Uh, this isn't a subtle move. Of course, we know that privatization is of a, you know of a public service. If you want to call corrections and custody a public service, uh, does not bode well in many ways, and we see that certainly in the delivery of health care. Um, this uh, the, the largest private contractor for health care in the U.S. is an organization called Horizon, and Horizon has been under many lawsuits, and I credit actually investigative journalists for uncovering the gross negligence and denial of care that uh, privatization incentivizes. And Rikers actually in, in New York City was under Horizon Healthcare, and you know after some of this data uh, was uncovered, has is now under the, the city and the health department. So. Um, but, but with the move towards privatization, we may see uh, a, a tilt or a shift back towards privatization of not just the prisons, but also healthcare delivery systems, uh, which are deeply problematic. And lastly, perhaps what's sort of most troubling uh, and agitating for people in criminal justice reform and public health space is the revival of the war on drugs, which is really a war on poverty and a war on race. Um, Sessions, Jeff Sessions, quickly after uh, he was appointed, has made very explicit that he wants to reintroduce mandatory minimum sentences, uh, which, as I explained earlier, was what uh, precipitated both the growth in the prison population as well as the deep racial divides in who gets arrested and who does not, um, and has also recently sort of spewed rhetoric, this is Trump, on capital punishment for drug, drug traffickers. I also want to... Um, in, uh, make clear that this line between drug dealers and drug users isn't always so black and white in spite of the rhetoric that you hear in the news. Many people who use drugs also sell drugs, and people who sell drugs use drugs. And so this kind of demonization of one side of the, of the, of the sort of coin uh, without really uh, is, is deeply problematic and I think uh, ineffective in policy discussions. So there are three take-home points um, in terms of you know, criminal justice policies that are being undone by the current administration that have immediate threats to public health and the health of this particular population. First is the reversal of key sentencing reform policies that were gaining traction during the Obama administration. 
Second is this sort of regression towards privatization of prisons, which has immediate uh, implications on health and healthcare delivery in these systems. And lastly is this attack on vital programs and the social safety net that the justice involved are specifically and uniquely dependent on. So I was gonna initially end here, um, but then I, I see that a theme in this conference is to you know, introduce a sort of glimmer or, or positive, uh, <laughs> positive note. Um, I, I personally feel that the sky is, is, is gray when it comes to correctional uh, and criminal justice issues. I don't think uh, Lady Liberty orients her gaze towards the hallways of prisons and jails, but, but I will do my best. <laughs> so uh, a cause that I've become very involved with is ending the cash money bail system in the state of California. Um, the cash money bail system is essentially a system that uh, incarcerates people not based on th their offense, but up based on their ability to afford bail. Uh, average bail in California is $50,000, which is prohibitive for virtually 90% of people who are incarcerated in California. Two, to three people in our, two out of three people in our jails are there without a conviction. So pre-conviction, pre-sentence, awaiting a court date. Um, as you can imagine, this has major consequences, not just the loss of jobs and disruption of social networks and so forth, um, but jails are also very harmful places for people to be in. In fact, the leading cause of death at LA County Jail, not dissimilar probably to many jails in the country, is suicide. Um, so in, in, in you know, the past two years, I've been involved in, in a legislative action to undo the money bail system and try to lend a public health voice to why this, is, this matters. Um, the bail industry is, is, a, is, a, is a hawk of an industry. They're a $2 billion industry. So uh, you know, I, I commend the work of these organizations and, and this coalition to, uh, to, try to try to undo a system that's been uh, quite profitable and I think very harmful to the health of the public. So, thank you. So, does this, is this working? This is working. Great, thanks everybody. Um, this was really educational and um, concerning uh, with lots of rich information and totally reminds me why journalists depend so much on the work you folks do. And just as a reminder for all the folks in the room, there are journalists here and don't, you know, forget us when you walk out of the room when you have good stories because we want to hear more about them. Um, so uh, we're going to leave it for questions for the room, but I, I, I just to start myself. Um, I was hoping to hear, uh, Michael, first a little bit more. You were talking about the history. Um, of um, Native Americans and um, this new period. And I, I'm just wondering right now over the last year, if you could talk a little bit about sort of the thing that concerns you most or, the, or that you're most worried about in, in, with this new administration as sort of part of this theme. Well, I, th I, I think my main concern, I mean, besides the fact that we've never been adequately resourced, you know, Indian Health Service has only been funded 50% of the level of need, so that's, a, part of the chronic history. But I think uh, my main concern with the administration would be the fact that they seem to be ignorant of or choose to ignore uh, this body of law that exists and, um, and are doing things contrary to the Constitution, doing things that are um, just, um, you know, I mean, it, it feels like it's, we don't have a democratic government, we have a monarchy. And um, I think that threatens the rule of law and that threatens basic principles upon which this nation has, has operated for, for hundreds of years. Tim, can you give us some sort of examples in terms of the communities you're working with about tangible things that have changed over the last year or that you're seeing? I'm asking you again. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then I was trying to, trying to. <laughs> it, in terms of tangible things. Yeah, that, just things that you're seeing because we're we've been hearing a little bit about the concerns about privatization of prisons, and and in terms of your communities, what I mean, you're hearing from on the ground about what people are saying. Well, I th I think you know it's 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 a. <laughs> Let's put it this way: In spite of everything that Indians have had to deal with and a lack of resources, there are some things that tribes have actually done 
in, in, in recent years because of Public Law 93-638 in its self-determination. They have taken over management and control of their own programs. I helped my own tribe take over a health center that the Indian Health Service had been running and, and staffing and not very well at that. Uh, and so you see tribes like the Cherokee Nation uh, who, who built their own hospital and the tribe is running, managing, and providing services to their own community. You see tribes in the Northwest who are managing their own health systems and creating their own health system. In Alaska, there's some wonderful examples of tribes who are stepping out and, and taking control of their health systems and providing better health care than, that was, than it has ever been provided under the Indian Health Service. And I say that back my tongue because I was with the Indian Health Service for 20 years, but I gave that up a long time ago. Okay, well, um, thank you. So, Azmin, I, I, the, the whole history of Puerto Rico is, is so compelling, and, and here we are at a time when we're facing the new hurricane um, season coming up in, in the summer, and nothing or very little has been fixed, and you, you really told the story very well. Um, I know there's no silver bullet, but, but what for you do you feel like, I mean, what should people be doing at this point to, to help this situation? Well, I mean, you know, the long-term fix is what happens, you know, r remaining in a, a colony is not an option. So then you have two options, either become a state, uh, and that's for, that, that don't have, that's politically not palatable to obviously Republicans or anyone else, uh, but I mean, ultimately you have to settle that issue of independence, right? And there's no appetite in the island for independence, so, uh, you're going to end up having statehood. That's a long-term solution. Uh, the short-term uh, solution is that we're recreating the same mistakes. Um, as the New York Times, the power grid has been created. Basically, they're recreating a 1960s power grid. Um, the fossil fuel industry has been extremely uh, successful in preventing any type of alternative fuel, uh, alternative energy uh, sources there, and they're recreating basically a lot of the stuff. You throw upon that all these other little insults, like the health infrastructure that need a tremendous financial boost, yet these recommendations to starve the, you know, starve it even more. Um, so, you know, short term, it's, you know, addressing these things, but long term, it's the colonial status has, that has needs to be addressed. Has the Trump administration voiced any opinion on status? Well, it's pretty clear. Republicans will never let the island become a state, right? I mean, you're going to immediately have two additional Democratic senators, at least several more uh, Democratic represent. I mean, that's a non-starter. Uh, for Republicans. So this is something longer in the future? Hopefully not two, hopefully two years. <laughs> uh, yeah, Senate and then, you know, House will probably flip hopefully in a couple of months, so. So um, in terms of the prison system, I'm, I'm shocked that there's 20,000 people in the LA County Jail. That's the, the same number as all the inmates in the state prison and jail system here in Massachusetts. That's such a huge, huge number. Um, we, we did a project on jail suicides recently and, uh, and how troubling that is. I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that issue in the county jails and what's being done to solve it. Um, I think it's very difficult. Um, you know, the, the, the tools that we have to predict risk for suicide in the jails are crude and imperfect. Um, we do screen for suicidality in the jails. We do screen for risk factors for the jail, for suicide in the jails. But quite frankly, they don't have the same, or they don't have the, the, the level of predictive analytics that, that we want them to, that, that, they, that we expect, that we want them to, uh, to do. And, and that's not entirely dissimilar from when I talk to my colleagues in psychiatry, uh, the suicide screening tools that exist in, you know, in, in outside settings, unfortunately. Um, but we do we do screen for for suicide, but I, I would say that that is not perhaps the most effective way to avoid it. Um, as someone, and, and I speak for my own personal politics and not the politics of where I work, uh, who really subscribes to an abolitionist framework when it comes to the criminal justice system, I think the the best way to avoid the harms of jail is to keep as many people out of there in the first place, uh, specifically people who are uniquely susceptible to the toxic environment in the jail, so people with serious mental illness, uh, people with addiction who are forced to withdraw from their drugs 
because we don't uh, provide a safe ways for them to, to withdraw, we force them to withdraw. Uh, forced drug withdrawal, by the way, is, is a known risk factor for suicide in the jail. So if you come in jail and you're like kicking heroin and you're not treated, um, then the, the dysphoria associated with forced withdrawal has been linked to suicide. Um, we have instituted, and so it's not all grim, we have instituted some programs to divert people away from jail uh, who may not need to be there. So uh, one of our programs is uh, called the MIST program, which is misdemeanor, people who've committed misdemeanors who are incompetent to stand trial. We, uh, because of you know a, an acute psychosis or other sort of cognitive issue, where we uh, divert them towards treatment-oriented facilities instead of keeping them in jail. Uh, we might actually expand that. There are discussions of expand that to felony population as well. Um, we are we're we've gotten significant funding and political uh, traction and support around uh, drug-related diversion programs, which are, are controversial in some ways, but uh, certainly keep people out of jail. Um, so, so I would say perhaps the, the, we don't have good tools to identify who will hurt themselves when they come into jail, but uh, programs I think that try to keep people away are perhaps the most effective way to avoid jail suicides. Great. Well, thank you very much. We want to open it up to the room for questions. <gasps> On the front line special, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, it was specifically stated that one of the areas of uh, concern was the incompetence and mismanagement of the Puerto Rican government prior to the governor now. You said that there was all external factors that were involved in, in the problems in Puerto Rico. Could you comment on the front line statements? Thank you. I mean, uh, yes. Is there corruption in Puerto Rico? Absolutely. Uh, we have 70 municipality, over 70 municipalities for 3.5 million people. Each time the administration changes, a whole bunch of contracts. We're trying to get for a study we're doing in Puerto Rico, EMS data, and it was clear every mayor of every town who gives out that EMS contract, make sure there's no data generated at any point. Um, so there is internal corruption. I mean, call up my dad every day, he'll give you the latest on who did what over there. Uh, but that's, you know, by all estimates, that's minuscule compared to the corruption that has happened at a much larger level to the island of Puerto Rico. So it does exist, but what's happened from outside is, you know, overshadows that by orders of magnitude. Oh, thank you so much, panel. You guys did a great job. This is a very difficult topic to talk about all these various uh, groups, the Puerto Ricans, the Indians, and all, obviously the uh, folks in jail. This question is actually directed to Dr. Tasima. I was actually interested to know more about juvenile incarceration rates. Um, do you actually have any data on that? I don't have, uh, I don't have the rates. I don't remember the exact rates per day, like how many are arrested per day. I know in our juvenile facility, I think we have about 2,000 or maybe 1,800 uh, juveniles arrested. It's also the largest uh, juvenile facility in the in the country. I do know that juvenile incarceration has precipitately dropped in the past decade and a half. It's, I think, 42% has dropped by about 42 or 48% um, due to, I think, robust uh, sentencing reform laws. So it is, it has shrunk, but it's still, uh, you know, it, it's still certainly the largest in the country and something that uh, there's, there is political will in California to, to downsize substantially. Um, uh, as far as the sort of health profiles of juveniles who are incarcerated, it's not, it's very similar to adults. There's a, you know, there's a, 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 a strong connection with, you know, mental illness. Uh, having a parent who's incarcerated is probably the main predictor of a youth who's incarcerated. Um, uh, the foster, p children who are involved in foster care, the prevalence of ACEs or tra trauma in, in children who in the juvenile justice system is profound. Um, but there is, but unlike the adult system, there has been more, I would say, sentencing reform and, and uh, reduction in that population. Um, but still some ways to go. One more question. I just, I had a question about 638. Uh, for in the Indian Health Service and the tribes. One of the concerns I have with the 638 model, and I just would want to know from your perspective, is I'm worried a little that'll end up being like the block grants 
And over time, money would be turned over in today's value, 2018, and then there would be no expansion. And so while the, I'm, I'm quite sure that the tribe can manage their own affairs, I worry about that sort of block grant kind of um, approach. Can you say what the 638 Yeah, 638 is public law 93638. It's the Self-Determination Act that was passed during the Nixon administration, which allowed tribes to take over comp. Now it's turned into contract or compact. Um, and I mean, that's, there's always that. I mean, as, somebody, as long as somebody else is controlling the budget, we're, we're all at the mercy of, of those people. And, um, and clearly, it's, it's, it's a challenge. But I still think that it is best when you have an option, and when you have few options, I should say, you have to exercise the options that you have in hopes that you can create something more with it. And compared to, and I can tell you my own experience, with the health service, um, they were doing next to nothing for, for my community. And, and unfortunately, that system has become sort of a, another bureaucratic system that is not, not, not always open to or concerned with or committed at the level that one needs to be if we're going to do something to improve the health of native populations. Um, you know, when you talk about resources, though, let me just take off on this. When you talk about resources, yeah, Indian Health, Ser I mean, Indian Health Service is looking at the federal government. But the one place you talk about Native people being invisible, and that's in corporate America. That's in, that's, that's in universities. That's in, in foundations. The major foundations in this country today, there is no Native representation on any of those groups. So, so therefore, there are no resources that ever come to Native communities because they don't see us, they don't interact with us, we're not invited, we're not included. Everybody says, well, the federal government will take care of them. Yeah, well, we've been taken care of, all right. <laughs> like Puerto Rico. <laughs> I, mean, we, I mean, we have so much in common. I mean, the, the parallels. And then you talk about Hawaii and what happened with Hawaii. Hawaii had their own queen, their own government. Same sort of colonial overthrow of a legitimate government, and now Hawaiians in Hawaii are the poorest and have the most outrageous mortality and morbidity rates, and they're, that is their land, just like this is my land. Please join me in thanking this panel. Thank you. Before, um, um, before we close, and I'm going to hand it, hand it over to uh, David and Steffi for uh, last words. Uh, three sets of thank yous. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I would like to uh, thank the um, staff who are behind this. Uh, this uh, doing something like this takes uh, thousands of people. This particular staff, the Dean's Office Communication, Lindsay Moragber. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to thank the, uh, all the speakers and all the moderators for what I thought was really fascinating, fantastic set of discussions. Thank you, all of you. And. Um, And uh, I, I really would like to thank uh, all of you for coming, both of those of you in person as well as uh, those of you online. Uh, usually we have about sort of twice as many people online as we have in person. Uh, I hope you all agree this is exactly, I think, why we collectively as a society invest in universities, to be able to have this kind of conversation, to be able to say, what are the data, what are the data, and how do the, these data inform us about how we may think about how we may create a better world. So thank you all for being part of the conversation. And thank you, Drs. Will Handler and Himmelstein for uh, arranging this. Last word goes to you. Uh, th thank you so much, Sandro, and thanks to the BU staff who's really made this possible. Um, you know, uh, uh, an optimist, I guess, would say at this moment that um, things can't possibly get worse. <laughs> uh, uh, and the pessimist, the reverse. Uh, Rebecca Cooney in our, uh, of The Lancet in our meeting yesterday noted that uh, pendulums swing both ways. Um, and uh, at the end of, of hearing the extraordinarily distressing news today. We want to really just remind people that pendulums do, in fact, swing both ways. So um, there have been periods in our history where things have gone the wrong direction and other periods where they have gone the right direction. And the question that we really need urgently to address is how do we get them going the right direction? So um, this is just one example of a, of a pendulum swinging the percentage of children in our nation who are living below poverty. 
And um, I've outlined 19, I've highlighted uh, 1964 here um, as a uh, date I'll call your attention to in just a minute um, further. Um, and um, same date pretty much uh, uh, outlined or highlighted here with an arrow, the number of people uninsured which dropped precipitously uh, as our government took action in uh, the 1960s. And, um, you know, it's notable the difference between the implementation of our Medicare program, which despite the Wall Street Journal predicting patient pileups and disruptions of medical care, was initiated 11 uh, months to the day after the uh, legislation was signed and was uh, initiated without any disruption and without any bureaucracy um, in our nation. Remember, in contrast, the implementation of Obamacare, which had substantial um, problems. And um, we also had this change uh, at around the same time, the, pers the ratio of black to white infant mortality that um, goes up and down um, and was going up and was reversed. Um, I just want to remind people that this wasn't just benevolent government leaders who brought us these programs. So this is a, a quote from um, Lyndon Johnson when he was senator from Texas in 1956 writing to one of his constituents. I am firmly opposed to forced integration and I firmly believe that the doctrine of states' rights should be maintained. Um, well, uh, after that, this kind of thing happened. Um, people took to the streets and, and made social change. Um, Selma, it's Selma, Alabama. So, if, yeah. so Selma, Alabama, the famous uh, yeah. Edmund Prentiss Bridge. Um, and medical people were involved. This is a, a short-lived medical organization organized by the late Walter Lear, who many of us remember, uh, leading African-American physician and one of the uh, first openly crusading gay physicians in the country as well. And um, one of the results of this was uh, evident in um, President Johnson himself. And I want to just play a, a very brief clip from his speech at the uh, graduation ceremony for uh, Howard University when he announced the program of affirmative action in this country. So this is the, the same person, uh, but I guess we're nine, nine years later. Could, could we play that clip? But freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now, you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. Thus, it is not enough just to open the gates of opportunity. All our citizens must have the ability to walk through those gates. And this is the next and the more profound stage of the battle for civil rights. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. We seek not just legal equity, but human ability. Not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. So the man didn't change so much as the country changed. And it changed because of the actions of millions of people around our nation. And health professionals played uh, a role in that. And we have a duty to play a role in the changes our country needs, not just 
coming from the top to change the politicians who lead us, but to change the sea that those politicians swim in, the data that they understand and understand not just as dry facts that we feed them, but as things that motivate our citizens and that condition the, the lives of our nation. So we have a charge as public health and medical professionals um, to participate in the, the changes that our country needs, and we hope that the efforts of the Boston University School of Public Health that the Lancet Commission and uh, many others here will contribute to that. Thanks so much for coming this day. Have a great afternoon, everyone.